All right, we'll call to order the uh, public hearing for, all right, I've got to flip my pages here. Public hearing for July 21st. Uh, uh, we'll open public comments um, prior to second reading of Ordinance 22-007, amending Ordinance 22-005, and amending Ordinance 17-005, the hotel motel tax, and amending Title V, Chapter 6, Section 5-603 of the Town of Kingston Springs Municipal Code. 602. Sorry, 602. The Town of Kingston Springs Municipal Code. Is there anybody here to talk on about the hotel hotel tax? Does not look like there is. All right, we will adjourn the public hearing and move on to the Kingston Springs Board of Commission meeting for July 21st. Could everyone please rise and face the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. John, could you please call the roll? Carol Clark? Here. Tony Gross? Here. Mike Harkis? Here. Glenn Rimmick? Here. Bob Stella? Here. All right, we have a quorum. Um, do we have a motion to approve the June 20, or sorry, the June 16th, 2022 public hearing meeting minutes? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have a motion to approve the June 16, 2022 city commission meeting minutes? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, do we have a motion to approve the July 21st, 2022 City Commission meeting agenda? Motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, Mark Brooke, I didn't even see you. Come in. There you are. <laughs> motion to approve. Yeah, straight hair, right? It's a little it's different. It's me off a little bit. All right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carolyn, do you have any announcements? Okay. Well, I do not. Bob? Mike? Yeah, uh, more announcement. Uh, on August the 7th, that's a Sunday afternoon, uh, the uh, King Springs United Methodist Church is going to have a hot dog cookout down at the Splash Pad. Oh, we'll be advertising that, asking the city to put it on their website. So I uh, just wanted to get that out there. Public information, I think Brandy says there's usually around 200 kids on a Sunday afternoon that show up down there over several hours, of course. What we'll time? be there. What time? Uh, it'll start uh, in the afternoon. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. When. So lunch. We'll lunch lunch is time. Yeah, lunch is till about you know early evening. I'm not exactly sure of the time to so start and stop, but that afternoon at the church. All right. Um, community input and concerns, but I don't believe anyone here submitted anything. I'll just double check if anyone want to speak to the rest of the commission. Good to move on then. Department reports. John, do you have anything to add? I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of quick updates. The Lundy Cup statue will be up tentatively scheduled for August 1st. So that statue will go up. However, it will need to be cleaned and resealed, and there are several things that uh, Mr. Cup needs to do before its grand unveiling. He won't know how long that's going to take and what kind of drying period, that kind of stuff. Uh, until it actually gets up. So, all that said, we've got it scheduled to be placed at the library for Lundy to finish working on it uh, on August 1st. And as soon as we find out, I'll give everybody as much advance to notice as possible for us to have a grand unveiling. You're going to keep it covered until is that we're going to try to, yes, sir. Is that the day that the, the crane is being brought yes. in? It's on the first. Okay. Yes, on the first, yeah, we, we scheduled for the crane to be here to lift it into place and then we will try to keep it under wraps as much as possible until we can have a brand unveiling and give you as much notice as possible before that as well happens. as you can hide a 11 foot statue yes. on a public street yeah camouflage in some way 40 miles an hour the um, um i think everyone uh, knows that uh, the town received the um, uh, rbdg the Rural Business Development Grant for $50,000 that we'll use to purchase a portable stage that will um, assist and help with uh, events around town that uh, should increase our tourism. So that was a nice news. Then our main tickets went on sale last night. Uh, as of this meeting, there are about seven left, I believe. Um, the Traffic Signal Modernization Grant contract has been signed. 
I don't have a star date for that. That, as you will remember, is TDOT's grant, 100% um, grant for the left turn signal at Harpeth View Trail and West East Kingston Springs Road um, that's not there on the northbound traffic. And then um, that's it. Very good. We go up that to the I had something on department reports. Oh. So just a question for John. Mm -hmm. On the any no smoking signs for the park, like in Burns Park, in the glass cases, at least just some cheap dollar ninety nine no smoking signs. When I was down there watering the other day, there was like five guys that were smoking on the porch of the activity center. And I didn't want to confront them, but if I had a sign where I could say it's not legal yes. to smoke in the park. And there are two things. One, there have been no smoking signs on the activity center porch railings or porch posts themselves i don't think they're there anymore mm -hmm. we've taken them down to try to kind of solidify the design of all the signs that are going to go in the park um, there is a master sign that is ready to go as well that has the list of park rules that we don't have right now uh, we had it at one point that was damaged and taken down as being repaired so it'll go back up it'll say no smoking uh, and then uh, we don't have a lot of additional signage, but I think there, on the splash pad rules, there are no smoking over there as well. But I think you're right; there should be probably on the pavilions should be some no smoking yeah, signs. Yeah, the glass cases are perfect spot for it. Yeah. Yes. So we'll, we'll we'll increase the number of those. Thank you. All right. Can we go up it's Good to move on then. All right, unfinished business. First item A is second reading of Ordinance 22-007, amending Ordinance 22-005, and amending Ordinance 17-005, hotel motel tax, and amending Title V, Chapter 6, Section 5-602 of the Town of Kingston Springs Municipal Code. All right, this is the second reading, so we've gone over this last time. This is increasing our hotel motel tax under the new uh, state guidelines. Um, do we have a motion? Make a motion that we adopt that uh, ordinance 22 dash or I'm sorry, 22 dash Do we have a second? Second. Any any discussion? All right. um, John, could you please call the roll. <coughs> Sorry. Carolyn Clark? Yes. Tony Gross? Yes. Lynn Rimmick? Yes. Mike Hargis? Yes. Bob Stone? Yes. All right, motion passes unanimously. We can move on to item B, which is discuss sorry, discussion on state status of updates on the following items, sponsored by Commissioner Clark, uh, the status of the Capital Improvement Plan workshop, which I believe we have an email that we're working on a date for that. Yeah, if, if, uh, if, if it doesn't take too, too much time while everyone's here, we had suggested uh, one day during uh, the week of the 15th to the 19th of August or one day during the week of the 22nd to the 28th of August to have that first meeting to set it up. Probably about 5.30, meet for a couple of hours to establish uh, sort of ground rules, goals, that kind of thing. So um, <coughs> the feedback I received, there were a couple of days that people could not attend, but for the most part, it was pretty open. So if you all have an opportunity to look at your schedules now, that perhaps we could narrow down a day. I, like I said, I, I will be out of town for a good portion of that first week. I actually, I believe, get back on the 22nd or the 23rd. So I'm kind of limited to after that. Okay. We should take on the 18th, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll be here. And I think Glenn will be presiding over the meeting that night. Okay, good. So then the 24th or 25th? If we did the 25th, that's another Thursday. I don't have that. 25th is fine with me. 25th? Does work for anybody else? Yeah, Okay, 25th at 530? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, Along those same lines, Joe was hoping that maybe at that meeting we could discuss possibly a survey to send out. I know, like in 2015 or 16, with yeah, that mass survey that went out for people, and I think with CIP might be a good idea. I think that mailer was like when I looked it up on the old minutes, it was $1,250, and it was sponsored by the JCB, and I'm not sure what that acronym stands for. Uh, yeah, we, uh, JECB, the Joint Economic Board. Yeah. So that was and they, that was paid for by them. And then I think Pleasant View actually just did one on Survey Monkey too or something. I remember all that happening. 
which I don't think that's a great idea, do you not serve the monkey like that? There were some issues that arose from <laughs> but, a, but a mailed survey with specific questions for what people want to see for the next five years, I think would be good, it might be a good idea. Yeah, we could look, yeah, John, do you, you know if there's any funds for that from the, from the county? I'll check. I've check got a JT. joint economics board meeting Monday morning. So yeah, I'll check with JT and see if there's a, there might be funds to do something like that again. Yeah, I'll been, check It's been a good while, so we can check and see. I mean, we should. All right. Um, then increase in residential commercial AFT. We had sample rates from uh, communities surrounding had done a little bit of research. Uh, really, it's just a matter of uh, the city attorney and I sitting down and drafting the legislation with those rates and bringing it to the board. So hopefully within the next, if not the August, uh, the latest, the September meeting, we'll have that information. What is AFT stand uh, Adequate facilities tax. We have a residential adequate facilities we'll tax, no but commercial. we don't have a commercial adequate oh, facilities okay. tax. And I think at the retreat we discussed the fact that like Burns has a dollar AFT and mm -hmm. for their residential even, which yeah. is a lot more than we have. Yeah, and we should definitely take advantage, I think, of the commercial side of that too. It's just Yeah. All right, and then uh, the status of AED placement in Burns and slash city parks. They were the new budget came out July first, they've been budgeted. So it's just a matter of us now making that purchase or installs. Okay. And I don't know if I told you, I remember Brandy had the question of whether or not it needed to be hooked up to any kind of electrical unit or panel. It does not. It's, it's freestanding. Okay. So it yes. no connections. Okay. And yeah, so it doesn't need to be centrally uh, like attached to our central alarm system right. or that kind of thing. But is there a way to do that? That I don't know. We do have an alarm good. system. There was a way to like do, you know. We can could, we could work with our alarm carrier to see if it's an op opportunity. Because wouldn't that essentially automatically call emergency services at the same time? As if our case taken out, I could be uh, I could envision something that if the case was opened, it would send an automatic signal to the alarm company that they would immediately dispatch someone. That somebody, I mean, I, it might be useful if there's a way to do that. Yeah, just we'll to, see if that's a possibility. If somebody needs needs that a defibrillator, if the if emergency services were automatically contacted in some way, that might be a right. even well, a greater. Mm -hmm. uh, I seem to remember Chief Ivy saying that's the way the ones that work that they have in the police car. I don't know. Could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, mission and vision statement. Can we? Yeah, that was, as we discussed at retreat, I, I, I believe that if this is all right, that we discussed developing a mission and vision statement that would then help guide the capital improvements plan. So um, I would like to, uh, at this capital improvements meeting that we have now on the 25th of August, to dive deeper into the development of that mission and vision statement. So then once that's, uh, you know, the vision statement or mission statement really uh, and just a very few succinct words helps give anyone that looks uh, at that statement an idea of what direction the company, or this in this particular case, municipality is heading, what's important to that municipality. So I think developing that, and I believe this is Mayor Gross's thought, that developing that statement would help drive the thought and the conversation on capital improvement plan as well. So uh, if it would be all right, we can. Uh, work that out at the August 25th meeting. And then the, the brush pickup? Yeah, that, that I talked with um, Ray Well, and he did not um, he had his bill for the, so far the, excuse me, the vendor that had done their brush pickup, but he, they had done other work, so he couldn't extrapolate what they did for their, yeah. for the actual brush cut. Uh, but he, they only had 30 people sign up. Sign up. So, you know, I know that there was a big fear before that we would have 2,700 people sign up for it, and we couldn't couldn't afford that. But I was thinking with that kind of, since it didn't it had that many people sign up for Pegram, if we even had like 50 or 100 people sign up at $1,800 per day for the carrier that we already have, the vendor we already use, uh, wouldn't be that much of a expenditure just to try it out for the first time and see, because I know there's a lot of interest in people. Uh, 
putting yeah. the trees by the... I talked to him about it, too. And of course, he said the primary reason they hired that service was not for this, it was like we did for like the emergency, mm -hmm. like needing somebody to for tree removal. Um, I, I think the, the concern would obviously just be as if it got too popular. <laughs> it's just the idea of like providing a service that, yeah. that, that nobody, that we couldn't, we couldn't feasibly offer to everybody. Yeah. Because if we did, in that situation, that's just where I think it becomes problematic. Is if we we're in a situation where I mean we can't offer a service to some to just a few people, I guess would be the, the problem. Um, I guess like anything else, I, like, we were talking about the not charging fees for the splash pad and try it out for a year to see how it works. I think you could try it out once, and if nobody signs up, then we know it's not going to be popular. But if you know 25 people or 50 people sign up, and it might be, you know, it might be, it might it might not be. Opening the cost is the problem. I'm sorry? I, I said the opening the cost is the problem. You just don't know, you know, what might be dragged out by the side of the road all of a sudden that would not have that would have been paid by private removal. So like new like new tree service and other I use them a lot. Yeah, well new tree is, is the ones that gave us the quote for the eighteen hundred dollars a day. Yeah, well that's my point is that most people contract with them privately. To, to remove trees or brush or whatever. Um, the problem's the open-ended. I mean, the fact that we had that many in Pigram doesn't mean we wouldn't have ten times that here. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'm comfortable with an open-ended so it's, you get 3,000 people, I don't know how many homes, but you can get a big ticket on that one. Versus you know, citizens do it themselves. Yeah, I just know a lot of people that I've talked to, like women on my street, and I've got three women that are, and they can no longer take care of the yards, and they try and drag it up, they have no place to take it, and they have, have said that it would be a good service to, to yeah. provide. And uh, I know when you talk to Newcomb and talking to Mr. Lowell, too, they had it very set up that there was two weeks of, uh, two weeks before people had to be signed up, they, they were, Parameters on what people can put out as far as tree limb length, and there was a lot of rules that were that were involved with that. But I don't know if they're doing it again in September or not, but they did it last September. So, Martha, you're, uh, I believe you have some knowledge of, of the workings of Pegram government. Like, how did they work that service in a way? I mean, the sign up part of Well, I mean, just like, yeah, I mean, uh, providing this, because I. Well, I mean, how did how did they provide the tree cleanup to, service? Yeah, and, to, to Commissioner Hargis's uh, point, my recollection on that, um, it, it was just kind of open ended. They just opted that you know mm -hmm. we're going to have the signups. We don't know how many people will do it, and they opted to provide that. Um, you know, and, and you definitely have to open. And we've had this discussion yeah. before. It has to be open to mm -hmm. everyone. Um, you can set parameters, mm -hmm. uh, just like Pegram has with size and everything, and you can limit, okay, you have to be signed up by X date, right. you know, have plenty of opportunity, you know, have online opportunity, come down here, sign up on a piece of paper opportunity, you know, you have to make it across the board equal for everybody to be able to do um, by X date. And, you know, at that point, you're going to know by X date how much it's going to cost you, you know, have to approve the funds, but again, they are open ended as to how many people don't sign up. And how many days? How many days? How many can they do in a day? They said 50. 50 in a day. Yeah. And I know in the initial proposal that, that I set forth, that they actually um, had the two week period, they had to sign it by two weeks so Newcomb can come and make the route that they're going to do. To me, it seems like the simple solution is just your street, just you guys organize your neighborhood and do it just for your street. I mean, it seems like that's the the demand and the request. If we had a storm like we had just, just outside the town limit, we would have piles of debris everywhere to remove. Um, they were all signed up for that in Port Worthy in the city limit when the tornado came through there. That's a huge problem. So if you have to set your window or windstorm hit and knock down a bunch of trees, then the city's responsible for that expense and not the homeowner, even though the homeowner has some coverage in their home insurance for that. It's limited, and it exceeded the limit a bunch in the hur in the in the tornado. I'm just saying that you know, depending on when you pick it, if you got to make it 
eligible for everybody. It's an open-ended ticket. I don't like the sound of that. I agree. It's worst case scenario for every, every Well, there is, but you know, you need to plan for that because it's your budget is certainly limited. So you, you just, can't just hang something out there that's eight hundred dollars a tree. I mean, that's what they charge. It's just another task for the city to take on. It seems to me exactly. Um, it's really the, it's really the property owner's responsibility to do that. But I, I mean, it's something nice to do. But the point is, there's an expense to it, and um, our budget's pretty tight already. So, Bob, any thoughts? I agree with uh, Commissioner Hargis. I think it uh, should be the homeowner's responsibility and not the city's. No, it wouldn't be the city's. We're just we're paying for a service for them to. Um, um, yeah, it makes it our responsibility. The city's. Right. It's organizing in addition to paying. <clears throat> And it could work exactly like you described, I mean, you know, not be a large cost, but on the other hand, it could be a financial disaster. So, you know, I don't know. Um, we don't pay for trash removal, so why would we pay for the brush removal? Well, that was the point to provide a city service like that. That every Pebram does it, Dixon does it, all the all the surrounding communities do it. Fairview does it. So, but Dixon, I believe, does it with their own. Their city public works does that. Yeah, I think they do garbage as well. Yeah, they do. They they do. They actually provide it through city staff, I believe. It'd be wise to compare other communities similar to Kingston Springs. You're going to compare communities. I'm not sure Dino Pleasant View does it. I'll ask Bill about it and see if they do. Nobody wants to do it. I, mean, that's, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, are we, we're, we're good here. So, we, I think we've covered everything in, in this list, haven't we? So, we'll move on. And, and uh, so, I've invited Matt Pelcher here to talk. I know we've discussed uh, the idea of putting an arboretum. On, I guess mainly I've discussed the idea of putting an arboretum in the lot next to the middle school. And Matt is our uh, local. Uh, Nursery operator, I guess, would be the thing. Pretty close. Drive Garden Center, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he, yeah. he's an expert on, um, uh, on on native species here as well. And uh, I believe Carolyn, you you all you work together some with the we park have. plantings as well. So very much yeah. together. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, Matt Matt is also knowledgeable about arboretums and what it would take for us to to do something like that. And I think I've stated what I feel why I think it's a great idea personally is I think it will stabilize that lot. Well, we had some flooding in some ways. It also gives us something we can do with that area uh, that uh, falls within the guidelines of what FEMA will allow us to do with that that area of land. And it's kind of a reclamation project where we're actually kind of taking some section and kind of giving it back to nature in some ways, uh, but in a way that I think will be educational to the community and uh, beneficial to the people that, you know, be able to walk down there, see the trees and learn about the trees and so on. So. Well, as Mayor Gross said, it's just a grass lot right now, so it's being mowed, and that's all that we're doing to it, which is costing, obviously costing the county some money and, and it's, um, or the city, and it's, it's just a unused space at the moment. So the idea of an arboretum is that, um, we come in and we plant a certain number of trees depending on what level of arboretum we wanted. My suggestion would be to start with level one, which is 30, 30 or more distinct species of trees. Um, the requirements are that we would have to provide a plan for that, which I'd be happy to provide uh, to the city. Uh, I have a good friend who is a, a professional landscape designer that lives in Kings and Springs, and she has volunteered to do a, an artistic rendering of you know of the of the whole thing so that would be part of the presentation to the arboretum board um, but we would have to have a plan and a plant key with the with labels of all the different species we're planning on planting my suggestion and this is just coming from me would be that we stick with all native tree species i think keeping everything as local as possible is great so if we used all native species instead of introducing a bunch of things that wouldn't naturally be growing in middle tennessee or, or the surrounding areas uh, I think it would be a little bit more educational for people that are that are coming from other places. I know that I tend to go to arboretums when I go to other cities. If I've got 45 minutes to kill, I'll look for the local arboretum and just wander. Um, but we would need the plan. We would need um, we would need to present an organizational or governance group um, that would likely be the city of Kingston Springs. Um, there would need to be. Uh, 
again, the list of all the things that we would, all the, all the plants that we would be planting in the space, they would all need to have labels. There are specifications for the labels that need to be weatherproofed, so there's some cost in the labeling and there's some cost in the trees. Um, plant cost depends <coughs> dramatically on how big we want to start with certain things, and I can make suggestions on, you know, what would be better to start a little bit bigger and what would be better to start a little bit smaller because it's faster growing, whatever the situation is. Um, but, um, and then for a level one, uh, we would just have to have employees of the city or volunteers um, that we could designate as maintaining the space. They want to make sure that the space is maintained and not just planted and walked away from. Um, and, then, um, and then basically they have to, they, they come by, we would apply for it, I believe in spring, they go through the applications and they approve the applications and then in summer they actually come and inspect. So if we wanted to move forward quickly, we could get things planted this fall, which is an ideal planting time. Um, and then we could, they could come by and they could approve the plan come spring and they could come by in the summer and walk through, make sure nothing's mislabeled or there aren't some dead trees there that haven't been dealt with. Um, and then, and then we would get a stamp of approval, at which point we, the city of Kingston Springs would go on the National Arboretum map. Um, so if, if, ever, if you're not familiar, you can get online on the National Arboretum page and there's basically, you just type in a zip code or a city or a, or a town and it tells you all the arboretums that are there or in the surrounding areas, um, which is how I find them when I go out of town. Um, so we need that and then, um, and then basic details like the dimensions of the space and the public access. Um, they will grant arboretum status to private property, but they don't like to. The idea of an arboretum is an educational experience for the public. So the goal would be that this would be a public space. There may be a path that goes through it so that you can kind of walk through and, and see the trees as you go through. Placards either mounted to the tree, they prefer stakes in the ground, um, just so it doesn't have to be removed and replaced as the tree grows. Uh, but basically it's a fairly simple and straightforward thing as far as municipalities are concerned. Um, when you're doing it on private land, it's a lot more difficult. But, uh, but for public space, it's a pretty straightforward process and shouldn't be too difficult. Um, the only uh, the only thing that I can think of that, that might be uh, an impediment would be you know just getting plants and getting them in the ground and being able to maintain them through their first year. Uh, most of the native species, if we can get them in the ground in fall, which is the ideal planting time, as long as we can keep them watered through the first through their first summer in the ground, um, they're pretty hands off. You can walk away and let them grow and do their thing unless we have some crazy weather like we've had this summer where it's 100 plus degrees and we don't get rain for months. But aside from that should be pretty hands-off. We'll have to mow the space that's still turf, but um, it'll be a lot less of it. And, um, and then the trees will provide some shade and some, and some soil reclamation for the, for the space. I know that, that space flooded in 2010. I know that it has flooded in other times. Um, this will help keep erosion down, or has it not? I thought it flooded one well, other I mean, time. That was, a, that was a pretty unique situation sure. when it did flood in 2010. Yep. Um, so, it a few houses. Yeah, it's right. some houses. I know there were three houses there that were, yeah. So that, uh, that's the presentation, that's the, that's the goal. Is, um, I think an arboretum would be ideal for a space like that that's going unused um, and, and would be a feather in the cap for the city, for sure. Man, I know we talked about an arboretum for it that we had, yeah. started possibly. Mm -hmm. The one thing I had on the list was that one public event a year, like an educational yes. event. Yes, event so there would event. need to be one public event a year, I'm sorry to mention that, there would need to be one public event a year on the space. Um, it can be an educational event, it can be a public event that just uh, is, is related to trees. So um, one of the things that I was thinking of at the Garden Center, I currently do uh, Tennessee Tree Day is a, is a date in spring yeah. where we do tree saplings. And I bring them in um, and, then, and then distribute them to people that want them uh, from the Garden Center. And I was thinking that would be a, an ideal event at the space. Um, and I could do it through the garden center. I could be happy to do it there, or someone else could take on that that role. But that would be a great distribution site, especially since it's centrally located in Kingston Springs. You've got the ranchettes on one side, and woodlands, and every the other parts of Kingston Springs on the other side of the interstate. So everybody can gather there. It's a lot more centrally located than my garden center is. Um, I don't often see people for that event coming out of you know the ranchettes or other places that are they're a little on the other side of the interstate. Um, so I think that'd be a little bit closer and, and more central for everybody. Uh, okay, but that would be, be a simple solution to that event. That would be a really great way for people to learn about the trees mm -hmm. that, that are going to be planting. And, I think that and would on be Tennessee Tree Day, awesome. all the trees they give away are native, so, um, so that would be kind of the ideal. Is, you know, yeah. Here's your tree, this is this what, is what it's going to look like, like over here, or yeah. it's that one over there. Um, so as, as they get bigger, they'd be even more representative of what people are planting, so they have a better idea of what they're getting. So you're going to come back to us with a budget? I can, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, and, um, and again, 
there, the budget can fluctuate considerably depending on you know what trees we select and what what sizes we want them to go in as. Um, I think we could really mitigate quite a bit of that by starting a little bit small. Um, not necessarily, we don't necessarily need to start with 30, 10 foot trees. There are already three tree species that are out in the open in that space. There's a sycamore, a black cherry, and a Virginia pine. So we've got a start with three mature trees, 10%. and then we can come in with what's that? <laughs> yeah, we're over 10 percent done already. And then uh, and then we can come in with you know with with trees anywhere from you know from three gallon to I wouldn't recommend doing bare root saplings just because of the level of care they need. That's better for your backyard where you can get the hose to them. But starting with three gallon saplings, which are relatively really inexpensive, um, up to if there's something really really spe spectacular, we might up for a 15 gallon tree. But container grown trees, uh, you know, we, we can we can find a range between fifteen dollars and and one hundred and fifty dollars per tree. Um, but I think I would lean towards you know starting small on everything. It's a little bit easier to get smaller trees started. They have a lot less water needs uh, than, than when you're going big. The only downside would be that if we do lose a few things, we'd need to replace them before they come to to inspect. But uh, but again, not it wouldn't be the end of the world. Does anyone have any questions for Matt on, on, on this? I, I thank you, Matt. That was sure, really, really good. For, and actually, I think everywhere I've discussed, I mean, there seems to be a lot of folks that are willing, would almost like to do this as part of a community project in a lot of ways, too. I've seen a, heard a lot of people. I mean, Mr. Reinecker right there, uh, he, he, the only reason he's here, and I didn't know that Steve had a uh, degree in forestry, but uh, you know, oh, he, he is here <laughs> interested because you're here. I mean, once again, if we had an event, we have experts like uh, Steve that could probably come talk to folks too. Well, the planting uh, so could absolutely be a, a volunteer-led project. Wouldn't necessarily fall to the city. It could be, okay. you know, I mean, I, I would imagine that there would be enough people in the city that would want to that would want to volunteer to come out and plant small trees. It's and not a massive undertaking. Uh, and they want to fund, fund it also. Down, they want sure. To fund yeah, absolutely. As far as the watering requirements in that first year, like getting through that first summer, like what was, how, how intensive is that? Um, not terribly. Uh, if we're planting in fall, it's a whole lot easier. Uh, okay. Planting in spring is the summer is the the hard the hard season for for new installation new plants, um, and so the longer the plant is getting in the, is in the ground getting established before summer sets in, the better off we are. So if we can plant in the fall, even if we miss this fall, mm -hmm. we plant it next fall. Um, we've got three seasons to get established. The plants need a lot less water through the summer. It would be, I, I would say that um, for the most part, they could be on, a, on an average summer left alone and left to their own devices. This summer would have been, I would have been wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, so I would hate to say there's, there would be no care needed, but, um, but I think we need to be prepared to, to find a way to water those uh, through their first summer in the ground if, if needed, um, which would be, you know, kind of be an on-call situation, figure out how to get it done. Um, you know, but even then, even in, in this summer, uh, twice a week, um, you know, if, if we've got people walking around with five gallon buckets, you know, um, it, it wouldn't be the end of the world. We could, you know, we could get 30 trees watered in, in 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, I can speak to the garden here at Burns Park. That's like for the whole year now, it's probably been every two, two, three days in the heat. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It takes a lot right now. Yeah, the garden center is a different story, but getting the plants in the ground, they're a whole lot more self reliant. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you, Matt. Any questions for Matt? All right. Move on to item B is a motion to approve write off of uncollected sewer debt of $911.81. I'll make a motion that we write it off. Do we have a second? Second. John, can you call the roll? Carol Clark? Yes. Tony Gross? Yes. Mike Hargis? Yes. Lynn Murray? Yes. Bob Stoller? Yes. Motion passes. Um, item C is a motion to approve resolution 22 009 establishing a 10% sewer fee increase. Does anyone have a, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion to increase. Yeah. Do we have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? John, could you call the roll? Carolyn Clark? Yes. Tony Gross? Yes. Mike Hargis? Yes. Lynn Rebick? Yes. Bob Stone? Yes. That one hurt a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, motion to approve change order one, safe routes to school project uh, T.10.123749.2. Do we have a second? Second. 
zero zero for revised increased construction costs in the amount of one hundred sixty nine thousand two hundred eighty two dollars, and I believe that's what we also have. The engineer here from Collier. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, as we, we discussed, there was um, for this is a safe routes to school project, which is along uh, Harpeth View Trail from East Kingston Springs Road to Cedar Court. Um, there was. Um, I guess best said a disagreement between Adams, which is the construction company that has the bid, and our contractor, uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, as our engineering firm, Collier Engineering, uh, on the feasibility of working the project as it was drawn. Adams and Collier then had discussions uh, and sections of the project, primarily, I believe, dealing with drainage, but we can speak about that when uh, um, our guests are here, uh, were reworked, and then this rework changed the scope of the project, which resulted in the change order that's before you. Um, Aaron Addington is from Collier Engineering. Uh, will be able to answer questions related to the change order, change order, and the engineering behind it. And then I have uh, on the speaker uh, is Davina from Community Development Partners here uh, via speakerphone to answer any questions. Community Development Partners is the administrative arm of this grant. She'll be able to answer any questions on. Um, uh, hopefully the impacts with TDOT and um, steps moving forward. Well, so, I think the, the main question we're all going to have is, you know, $160,000. <laughs> so, Mr. Addington, if you want to. Yes, um, thank you all for having me here. I'm Aaron Addington from Collier Engineering, and uh, I believe he's in front of the camera. Right? Yeah, if you want to come up here oh, to the podium. Oh, sorry. Can you see that? Yeah, come up to the podium over here. Okay. Um, oh, I mean, it, it must be just to go on the. But just for clarification, I believe the camera is running because it'll still go on YouTube. We're just not. It's not live today, yes. I guess. And that that answers the question for you. So there will be an event. She'll be able to watch the meeting online as well. Yes. Then just after the fact. Go ahead. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm Aaron Addington. I'm with Collier Engineering, and just uh, want to dispel one myth. I'm not an engineer. Uh, my boss, Jeff Stevens, is. What my expertise is in is in the TDOT local programs process. I used to work up in the TDOT local programs office and I've been doing the TDOT local programs process for you know over 16 years now. And so that's where my expertise is in how local programs projects get through the process from getting a project award through the NEPA phase, through the design phase, right away phase, and now we're into the construction phase. Um, I've been briefed by my boss, Jeff Stevens, on the big parts of this, and uh, you know, and then I've got my experience on other projects that I've dealt with that uh, you know, there is always a disconnect between when you hop from your TDOT pre-approved plans into the construction phase. Um, you know, two people can look at the same set of plans and come to different conclusions. And I know that uh, our boss, Jeff Stevens, has kind of worked back and forth with Adams Construction as best we can to, to get these things, uh, you know, resolved as best we can. But, you know, the contractor, as I understand it, uh, won't start work until they have an assurance that the change order is in process and uh, you know that's kind of the sticking point. Um, the plans that were sent to the contractor were approved by TDOT or they were reviewed by TDOT. TDOT doesn't actually approve anything ever. All they do is concur that they meet the standards. Um, TDOT did concur on the bid estimate and so those are the things that we had to go forward going into the bid and now that after the project's been bid and awarded, and the contractors had uh, some time to look at it. They've come back with these things as points of issue. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, I can tell you from my experience, the change orders, once you get to construction, are not uncommon, unfortunately. And um, you know, I have, you know, I'm here to answer any questions you have about the process stuff. So what was the biggest cost increase? I think it just came, you know, as I understand it, kind of a death by a thousand cuts. I've looked through, again, I'm not an engineer, and if we if we need to kind of go point by point on the engineering stuff, we're going to need to get my boss uh, in here. But 
Um, I'm just aware of how the process works, getting how we got here, and then what what our next steps will be uh, moving forward. So, John, who's who's responsible for the overage? Is that handled at all in the in the TDOT grant? Do they take any share of that, or is that all city responsibility? Right now, we have no assurances from TDOT that they will chip any extra funding into this particular project. We have hopes that TDOT will chip in additional funding to this extra project, um, extra funding to this project, but we don't have any assurances that they will cover any of this uh, additional cost at the moment. TDOT, uh, as far as their, um, hold, on, and hold on just a second. Davina, can you hear? I can hear. Okay. Um, if you would like, I can I can take over. That would be fantastic. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, as of right now, the change order has been submitted to TDOT for their review and approval. What is uncommon in this change order is the thirty, approximately thirty-five percent increase in the project cost. Now, TDOT does not have a hard rule that I've been able to find or locate in writing, but most funding agencies typically discover a, a 25 percent increase in any project cost. Anything above that would be considered a scope change. So that's my biggest concern in TDOT reviewing this change order initially just to see if they would even approve it. Um, they're probably going to come back and ask uh, a little bit more detail on the change order just due to the nature and, and I expect them to come back with more questions. They've had a couple of questions so far that we've responded to. We've also requested the additional funding um, to hopefully cover this change order and that of course is contingent upon the availability of funds and TDOT's desire to contribute funds to the change order. Um, that will come as a written request. We have made an uh, um, unofficial request as of now when we submitted the change order for the additional funding. But again, we don't have a definite answer. I was hoping to have one for you tonight. We don't have a definite answer on whether or not they're going to approve the change order. My concern again is the change order amount is greater than 35% of the original contract amount. And normally funding agencies typically don't like to see anything more than a 25% increase um, in any total project cost over the life of the project. So that would be my number one concern. My number two concern is whether or not they're willing to contribute additional funds. As you know, they've already contributed a small portion of funding um, to the project when we bid the project because the bids came in over, over the estimated amount to begin with. But right now, I can't give you a definite yes or no. If it was 25%, would you be confident it would be approved then by TDOT? I wouldn't necessarily be confident at 25% that it would be approved, but I would be more confident. Um, TDOT does approve change orders. That's not uncommon. Um, it's not uncommon for them to cover the added overages and right now my understanding is TDOT does have funds available. Um, my biggest concern is just the sheer volume of the change order and if this is going to be the only change order since we haven't even started construction yet and this is already a 35% increase. So Davina, do you have uh, a thought on as far as actions of the board, if they approved or denied this change order, what next steps would be? The next steps, if they denied the change order, would likely be going back to TDOT and discussing what they would do. You would more than likely need to rebid the project since the project hasn't gotten started. Um, you technically have an open contract with the contractor they, I think, are adamant that this change order is needed in order to proceed. Your engineer, of course, has agreed with them that this is an adequate change order in order to proceed. So that could possibly put a damper on this contract as it is without the approval. So that may be we need to take a step back and re-bid the project. 
Now, if you did move forward as of right now, if you would move forward and approve the change order, the best step going forward would be to approve it maybe contingent upon adding TDOT fees or approve it with the city kicking in the added overage, which would be the a whole 169000 Those are the options going forward at this time. If, if we did go forward and approved it, is there anything that we could um, lock it in at 169 or would we be open to them having more overages when construction started? I don't see a way to lock in anything when you're dealing with construction, but that would probably be an engineering question. Um, there's always going to be, at the end of a construction contract, you're always going to have overages and underages based on actual use quantities. Um, so that could possibly change. It could possibly increase. I don't foresee it decreasing just due to the nature of the economy right now. Um, but those typical balancing change orders are not huge change orders. So when will we know what the decision of TDOT? Uh, TDOT typically reviews the change orders fairly quickly. It can take up to two weeks. They've had it for about a week. They've asked a couple of questions. We provided some information for them. Uh, the last time I provided updated information was on Tuesday, I believe. So they've only had it a couple of days since they got the answers that they requested. Um, so I would hope to hear something next week. appears to me that we need to answer those questions before we decide to proceed because we don't know what it's going to cost. So, Davina, to uh, Commissioner Hargis' uh, point there, we have a, uh, a special uh, meeting scheduled for October, sorry, August 4th, which is about two weeks from now. Would it be possible perhaps to, as an option, to defer any kind of decision this evening until that August 4th meeting in hopes that there is some additional information received from TDOT between now and then? Or is this an issue with this change order, order that needs to be settled sooner rather than later? I think tabling it until your August meeting would be acceptable. Um, they still may come back and require you as a city to say yes or no before they approve it. I have seen that in the past. Um, so I'm not positive going forward how they're going to proceed on that side of things. But we would definitely have more information for that board meeting. Okay. So. That would be a possible option then to just go ahead and push it to the fourth and see if we know anything more in what a, yes, sir. a week and change. Make a motion to table motion to change order one. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Spring, you need me for anything else? Huh? You need me up here? I think you can. You can. Do we need to probably head out if you want to. Yeah, I, I think. I'll stay around after okay. if you all have Thank any questions. So I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. All right. On to uh, Commissioner Clark's discussion of River Care proposal. Yeah, if you'll have a chance to to read it, yeah. I don't want to rehash everything that's on here, but. Um, I think last year, Farmer's Market, John and I talked about trying to get tours and hooked in, or the businesses hooked in with the canoe business. Yeah. yeah. Somehow hooking that, hooking that up. And then at the Farmer's Market this year, Beth Hubner came by and was talking about how the river is so, so crowded now with the canoes and everything like that. And she was going to the Piney River and she talked about river etiquette and how people are just kind of piling up on each other. And so I thought, well, I want to marry these two ideas together and, and come, up, come up with something where we could. Uh, partner with the canoe businesses, partner with our town businesses who want to be a part of it, and engage the TWRA and the state park personnel, and come up with something, uh, I think, yeah, did I have my sign on there? Yeah, yeah this would be, 
to put up signs at the new businesses if they want to get involved with this. And I think that they have kind of a vested interest to be involved in this and keeping the river clean because it's their people they're putting on it. And, uh, and looking up at Harpeth Conservancy, I know that they have biodegradable trash bags that they pass out. And I thought if we put a sign up at all the canoe businesses with people uh, picking up their trash and having all the, the rules on here, not rules, but that's why I call it river care instead of river rules, people might be more amenable to doing that. So don't, don't disturb the wildlife and plant life. Be aware of voice volume. Be aware of nesting sites on the shoreline. Don't break branches. And then observe the rules of the water road. Be considerate of your fellow canoers and, and uh, kayakers and whatnot. And then basically the last part, if you don't trash the river, pack it in, pack it out, leave no trace. And then uh, when they bring back the litter bags, and hopefully they can also, if it's reasonable, they can bring back other trash that they see on the river. And I know that on um, social media, I think it was uh, Teresa Lyles was talking about the sandbar that her parents own that's just trashed all the time. Like people coming out there and just dumping stuff and everything. So I thought if we could just get people engaged to keeping the river clean and engage our town businesses so if people bring back their bag of trash to the canoe businesses or wherever designated point would be, uh, that our town businesses would provide a $2 coupon, a $3 coupon, a free drink at NAPCO or something. And that would also bring people that are coming from out of town to the canoe places into our town, mm -hmm. into, into yeah, our restaurants and whatnot. Yeah. And I made up two different ones. so. If the canoe businesses wanted to give a, a discount on a canoe rental, if they want to be involved in that way, or just the town businesses. And uh, and I think that the only expenditure that we would have provided if businesses all want to be part of this would be a sign of the river rules, say, at the canoe businesses and maybe at our the placement places down at uh, City Park where the canoes go in mm -hmm. and just have the signage up there as well. And I think people, I think, if they, if they know they're going to be a little small monetary reward, they might be more apt to do it. And I think if people feel involved in keeping it clean, they may be more apt to, to do that. And I think uh, it would help in three regards. Remind the folks of the river etiquette and respect, educate, promote, and result in clean litter on the river, and promote our town businesses. I mean, I kind of think it's a cool idea. I, uh, you know, the, doing it at the park would not be a problem. I don't know what, you know, and, and of course involving our town businesses shouldn't be a problem either that I can think of. The canoe businesses are outside of city limits, which would be the only issue I'd possibly see there, but then they do launch within city limits, right. so that is there. We do have the park down there, so. My, um, my biggest concern would be if you're going to involve town businesses, you have to involve every town business. Who want to be involved? So sure. you know, every, you have to solicit invitations to everyone. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a home operated business, if it's somebody that does um, any business that's registered with the with Cheatham County within the confines of the town of Kingston Springs, Springs. You need to be involved in the process. Sounds like a better um, Friends of the Harpeth River State Park or, uh, program. Sounds like something that would work better with that organization. Except for our town businesses, this is a way to get tourism to our businesses. It is a way, yeah. It, it, it brings people from the canoe business to us because most people who just leave on, on the, inner, or the highway go back to Bellevue or whatever direction they came from and That's don't stop here, and this would bring them here. Does the county have a list of all businesses in Kingston Springs? Yes. With that mailing address? Yes. So we could we could notice them all by mm -hmm. letter and then call on the ones that felt like we wanted to explain the letter to you. I mean, I guess I feel like you know some businesses mm -hmm. most businesses aren't going to want to do it. Like I mean, no. if you guys send it to me, I'm like, what am I going to give them? Like a free give them a free mail? Or right. Free, give them some well, stuff. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. But you <laughs> give an angle iron. I think the businesses yeah. that Carolyn had representative in, in, in on her her page are probably the ones that are going to be Would most be interested and going to be involved. Yeah. But just to right. make sure that. We stay as a town. Out. We're right. all inclusive. Then we well, that's, that's how you can offer to all of them is right. by using the letter to the list of business addresses, and then let, let those you know have some kind of response on the letter. So. Yeah, because who knows? Pencils may want to offer something. You know? Yeah, I mean, or you don't know. So. AK Lube could offer yeah. two bucks off an oil change yeah. or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But. Uh, 
other than I mean, because I, I think that I don't know that other than the fact that I guess there's some administrative work to to, to offer it to everybody. Um, people are only going. I mean, some some people's businesses they know that you know most people have enough, enough knowledge of their business they know that if they offer something that you know like like if my accountant offers like you know a discount for accounting like but nobody's mm -hmm. going to do that mm -hmm. but people might go buy a get take five bucks off a of pizza or something yeah. so yeah. <laughs> and, and it does it does you know that's that's always been a huge issue is the fact that I mean, I don't know how many people I run into that are like, oh, we love canoeing down the Harpeth. And I was like, they're like, where's Kingston Springs? Mm -hmm. They have no idea. So I mean, they just, they live in Nashville. They go down Highway 70, and it's like we aren't even here. And we talked about having some sort of signage in Pendicle Hill or some sort yeah, of... Yeah, we've uh, talked about that in the past. I think the only expenditure would be the signs themselves, which we know aren't that expensive from the, the, the coupons, signs. The coupons themselves. And well, we, that's my idea that I think I put in here is that um, some kind of token, and then which, that if, depending on the, the stores or restaurants or whatever you use it, they turn in some kind of token to the store, and then that way they can also keep track of it too and say, wow, it's really working for the, for the store. But yeah, th that's something that can be hashed out as far as what it would actually be. But, I mean, we, we, we just increased the hotel and motel tax today, which is literally funds that have to be spent on something like this. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and sending out letters to all the businesses that would not, the expense would be the staff time to do that and then the stamps, which is not a, a big thing, but you know, moving forward and being involved with businesses and sort of the facilitator as uh, the middleman of any kind of discounts, that that's gives a little me problematic. Pause. I think that so I don't know if Martha if we could some, be real careful about how yes. we dance on that. Yeah. If we could limit it to I mean, making the signs and sending yeah. out the letters, that, I mean, that's something I think we can but Yeah, we don't want to be involved tourism, in the business of the businesses. Right. Yeah. So. yeah, so we need to find out where those lines are. We, we'd also have to coordinate the tokens or coupons or whatever are handed out outside the sea limits. I mean, that, that may be a situation where it's good for us to partner with Harper River Conservancy. Friends of the Harper you know, River, yeah, Harbor, you know, system. Right. That way, there, there's somebody that's going to be taking care of that that's not us outside right. of our municipal boundaries, but yet we're working in partnership with them to draw people in. Mm -hmm. So we, we can certainly figure or, out. Or even the new businesses themselves. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if we got a, uh, yeah, if we got a nonprofit to take it on, but then we just help them promote it in some way too. Or if they're, if they're not, I mean, they're a nonprofit. If they're a non, you know, 501 3C, we could even, Contribute funds to that nonprofit for this purpose as well would be another way the town could be involved. Would maybe cut out some of the, you know, I don't know. There's there's a lot of ways that I mean, that's a good idea. I think there's a lot of ways we could find to do it too. We do river cleanups. All uh, I think the know. main purpose of this is trying to get business people to come into a the lot business, of it is. So. Yeah. I mean, um, hopefully it, it does a little bit of both. But right. But. But there's I would love to there's liabilities in encouraging people to pick up trash also. That's true. Well, that's what I have on there. If you come across others' trash, you can safely retrieve. I think, you know, that's definitely in there. So I guess uh, city attorney and I can kind of feel this out and see where our boundaries lie and um, where we need to go and, and kind of report back. So are they put in at the canoe places and then they come through the town or are they do it at the park up here. Actually, one of the biggest uh, like uh, put-ins is okay. at City Park. Uh, it's City actually park. right. It's yeah. actually state-owned property. That that canoe launch is state-owned property. Okay. It's it's the one right down there between the circle two parks, right mm -hmm. there. It actually originally was town property, correct? And then it we, the town actually partnered. I, I think turned that property over to the state. That I, I believe, don't know. I believe that's the case. But like that's for, as far as the outfitters go, that's their, by far, that's the, the, they call it the ballpark run, and that's the biggest thing. But there is there. another little place to put in up by Pigram, right? Yes. There's, there's, many. there's many. There's many yeah, places. There's, many okay. places. Okay. there's several they put in there. I choose the Pigram one. I like that one. <laughs> Less populated. So if they put it in at 
city park that go around the park by the big bluff mm -hmm. and out. Past Lost Farms, past, uh, and then down they pull out at the bridge on uh, Highway 70 that's by the outfit. Yeah, okay. It's about a two hour run. So they haul all the canoes up here to our park and put them in here. Okay. If you come up there on a Saturday morning, they're stacked like cordwood. Well, I'm up above it, so they, I, don't see, I see the ones coming out of the other state park up there. There's a little landing up there by the bridge, I guess. Yes, yes. We float right by your house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a it's a worthy idea to at least explore, and if we don't find a way the town can do it, I mean, we should definitely find a way to maybe partner with a nonprofit to do this in some way, shape, or form. Okay. All right. What are your thoughts on Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, I don't think the city should be involved in it, but yeah. I mean. All right. Um, We'll move on to surplus items, and we have one item for surplus, and I think this is the first time in my eight years as mayor that I've surplused a building. Um, so do we have a motion to surplus the structure at 431 Park Street and approve staff advertising and accepting requests for proposals to remove house structure? So moved. Second. First of all, all in favor. Aye. 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 Passes. Any other discussion? I'm forgetting. Anyone? We're in a good spot. Oh, go ahead. Actually, I do. Um, I know you all know about the what's going on at Forest Road. The yeah. bridge. The bridge. And they got the private property owner who wants to close it down and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and I talked to some other people out there and that live on South Harpeth, and I was doing some um, research on that. And I didn't know if the town could or would. I know that you have done motions before in support of something, in support of uh, or against the Burns Park, the, the, not, the, no, I'm sorry, no, the, the Burns Field Depot, depot yeah, yeah. and against the quarry and whatnot, the resolution showing support against that. And I know that in the research I did, found, I found that uh, if there's an adverse use continuing for 20 years, that creates a prescriptive right. So that is not really a private road anymore. It's a public road yeah. because it had 20 years of use as a private road. And so I know they're really having a hard time getting Williamson County to look at that as so adopting it and, and accepting it and, and the formally accept it as a county road along with the maintenance that goes along with it. And uh, since the, the private road owner is trying to close it, I think they're probably going to have a hard time, he's gonna probably going to have a hard time doing that since it is a public road, at least from my understanding, that the, the prescriptive right has um, op opened it up to be a public road. Could we do a resolution in support, perhaps, of urging Williamson County to accept this road as a part of their their road structure? We're, since a lot of our people, don't know a lot of people on our, yeah. our roads and our side trying to use that, and we're actually detouring it to that road. Road, I know. And. Uh, because they're going to be left with, and when Anderson Road closes down, they're going to be left with one way getting out through Davidson County to go to Ferry. Yeah, that's pretty And so I didn't know if, if we as a commission would could do that or would want to do that, or just to kind of some, I know it's just symbolic and supportive, but if but we it could might help now. to have Williamson County take that road. Um, you know, we, we, we've done very few resolutions in support, or I guess, and I don't know what the official positions are on this or if anyone else has taken one. I mean, I know it's a huge issue. John, have you heard any more on this? I actually got a call this week about it. Um, no, just that the, the parties that are involved are still trying to encourage Williamson County to take this over as part of their road inventory, and Williamson County is still refusing to do so. Why is Williamson County so reticent to? What, where is this? Brush Creek Forest Drive. Yeah. Sheds over the web. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's it's a, yeah. But everyone from locally to, from our uh, public safety officers and firefighters to uh, the county to the sheriff's department to emergency services to EMS yeah, are all aware of the School situation. Buses. So, um, School bus, do buses drive over mm -hmm. too, don't they? Not there? anymore. Oh, yeah, they don't anymore. Nope. Can't get there. Yeah, so with school starting saying that's going to even amplify the issue. I mean, I, I would be for 
We could do a resolution in support of Williamson County adopting the, the bridge and or adding it to the road. I don't think that, I mean, it's symbolic, but it might do something. I mean, at least it shows where we stand on it. So, so it's a private bridge? It's located, it, it is, County. It's it's located in Williamson County, but it's, it's kind of critical to folks in Cheatham County it's, and even some folks in Kingston Springs. It's out of city limits, though. It is out of city limits. Uh, it was out of county but limits. But a lot of, of people who live in the city use, use it. it to get around now. Right. And the fact that you know, it is a private road, but it's really a public road now. And we do provide emergency services out to some of those areas, correct? So, yes. so primarily Pegram, I think. Primarily the primary so. bridge has been condemned. The bridge has been condemned. So that's just, is that right? I don't know that it's no, been condemned. I just, it's it. never it's been not, inspected. That, so, so what it comes down to is the owners have the bridge, and people are using it, and they, the owners would like Williamson County to adopt the bridge. But Williamson County is refusing to adopt the bridge, so what they're saying is, well, this bridge isn't inspected, it's on our property, it's a liability, as long as we're letting people drive across it, fair enough. So what they would like is, of course, for Williamson County to adopt it, but they're saying, well, if nobody's going to adopt it since it's a liability to us, we're just going to shut the bridge down right. and not allow people to pass on it, and that's where the issue was. Okay. Martha Brooke, you may know the answer to this. When I was looking at the state of Tennessee, I found an uh, opinion of the Attorney General, and they went through the public road may be created by an act of public authority, express dedication by the owner, implied dedication uh, by the use of public and acceptance by them with the intention of the owner, and all the people I talked to said that was the intention of the original owner to go ahead and make it, or adverse use for a period of 20 years, which it has been, so it's basically a public road. And uh, I'm sorry, and then the, the other part of my question was, um, for Williamson County, I would think that they would want to do this because it says for the Government Tort Liability Act to come into play on a private, non-dedicated road, there would have to be sufficient factual evidence to support a finding that the private road user, private road has been converted to a public road by implied dedication or by creation of prescriptive right by adverse use. So they would be liable if something happened anyway, wouldn't they? Well, not having read that opinion, just kind of speaking in, in, yeah. in general terms, when you say a, a public right-of-way, there's two different ways to look at it when you dig down into to dirt wall. Mm -hmm. So you've got public roads like what we talk about here in this room, which are roads that the city says, yes, these are ours, we pave them, we plow them, you know, that, that's them. And, and that can happen either by uh, offers of a dedication when somebody puts one in, uh, or a deed of the town, or if the town decides they want to create one, they go in and condemn the property and take it, or by by implication, where they have gone in over the years and paved it and salted roads and, and, and used, used it, or it showed that they intended for it to be a public use. There's quite a few roads in this county like that. Um, so that's that kind of public road. Then you've got you know public right-of-ways, a lot of times how we heard here it referred to, where it's not necessarily claimed to be owned by a governmental entity, but it's one that general public has made use of to access different places. Uh, and if a property owner has slept on their rights of keeping people from doing that, then yeah, they could lose that right to cut them off. Um, you know, I'm not rendering an opinion as to this particular one because I don't know the circumstances, too, but you've got those two distinct uh, possibilities or, or types of, of public ways there. Now, I believe most bridges in the state are in the state of Tennessee are governed under TDOT. I know TDOT is real particular about who they like to go in and fix bridges and inspect them and all that. So, you know, that could potentially be a hang-up that Williamson County is having to deal with too. You know, when you accept, just like when we accept roads, we have certain standards that they have to be brought up to uh, before we will accept them. Uh, same thing is going to apply in this situation with the bridge, and I can only imagine that it would be a lot more stringent than how much asphalt is, is laying out there. Um, so, you know, just depending upon the circumstances that they are, I'm not sure why Williamson County would. There's probably more information out there that Williamson County has that we, we don't. Um, but if Williamson County has in the past done anything to indicate their ownership of it, if they've paved it or salted it, like that, then that could potentially indicate that they have accepted it at some point by their very actions over a course of time. Um, you know, their their county attorney may very well disagree with me, <laughs> um, but that's that's what you would look at. If you look at old case law about um, 
acceptance of roads, use and actions on those by governmental entities would indicate that they have accepted. If there's even if there's no formal acceptance, so depending on what's happened on this bridge over the last many years, mm -hmm. it did it rise to that level or not? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Can we do a resolution? I don't think there's anything that would stop us from doing a resolution. No, you, you can <laughs> do resolutions all day long. Twice on Sunday. <laughs> we can have one. Um, we can have one ready for the uh, August fourth. August meeting. Oh yeah, August fourth meeting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're going to be here anyway. Why not? Okay. Okay. Cool. Our, yes. I'm sorry. Commissioner Clark, would you forward me the exact name of the bridge and the road? Sure, sure. Right. I'll spell correctly. I can send the AG opinion to and everything. Thank you. All right, uh, I believe the only thing coming up is we have farmer's market uh, this week. And then, oh, oh, oh wait, next week's the night farmer's market. Correct? Yes, the 28th. And then we'll on Saturday, night. and then we have another farmer's market on the 28th. Uh, in the evening. Yeah. Five to eight. Five to eight. A little bit cooler in the evening. Maybe. <laughs> it won't be at five, I'll tell you that much. Well, John, as you put together that resolution, I think it could be. Don't reference the fact that the school bus was used that route and that the public safety officer fire the police used that route. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's going to have a lot of impact anyway. I was trying to tell Williams County what to do, probably not going to work very well. But um, if you cite those two things in the resolution, uh, somebody might be more apt to read it anyway. Okay. John, I can send you two with the yeah. all the homeowners sent out too, and it's got all that listed on there. All right. Who yes. Uses, who uses the room? Yes. I'll call the pieces of that together into a, a resolution. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.